until kickoff. Three. Yes. <coughs> well, last year, despite Saquon Barkley's kickoff return for a touchdown, the Lions fell by one point to Ohio State. Exactly one month from today, the Buckeyes will be heading into Happy Valley. So on that day, how many of you will be wearing, by show of hands please, blue and white? Most of the room. Okay, anyone that will venture to wear scarlet and gray on that day? Oh, you have some company, right? It's not an entirely hostile crowd. Well, the head-to-head -head gridiron matchup is 18 to 14 for the Buckeyes which is just fine with today's uh, speaker and fellow Rotarian, Mike Froelich. Mike was born and raised in Columbus. He earned both his bachelor's and master's at The Ohio State University. Whether a fan of the Buckeyes or the Lions, I believe we can all agree that Mike Froelich has been a great asset to our York County team, both in his leadership of the York Fair and Expo Center, and also in our club and in our community. Kudos to the members of the York County Agricultural Society Board of Directors for bringing Mike to York. Mike is the first general manager of the York Expo Center and the York Fair. Before coming into hostile Nittany Lion territory, uh, Mike was general manager of the Ohio Expo Center and the Ohio State Fair, executive director of the Georgia National Fair and Agri Center. He's a former board member of the International Association of Fairs and Expo Exposition Centers, and currently a board member of the York County Convention and Visitors Bureau. How many days until the York Fair, Mike? Uh, next week. Next week? Okay. <laughs> here, here, other than that one, here are four stats that are important to Mike. 200 million, 50,000, 123, and 6. 200 million is the estimated annual economic impact of the York Expo Center. 50,000 in scholarships have been awarded during Mike's three-year leadership of our Education Fund Committee. 123, he knows this one, that's why he's smiling. The number of days left until his retirement. <laughs> and finally, six, in retirement, Mike looks forward to spending time with his wife Brenda and their six grandchildren. Please welcome a man who says he bleeds scarlet and gray, fellow Rotarian and Buckeye Mike Froelich. Hey, can, every, can everyone hear me okay? Can you be up a little bit more? Okay, very good. Well, I'm uh, very appreciative, Anne, of your comments. It's always uh, nice, and uh, you've been a big supporter of mine in the York Fair and Agri Center and uh, Expo Center, so thank you so much for that. So, uh, today, uh, I'll have a, a PowerPoint presentation here, but before I start, I want to introduce one person to you, and that's my successor, Brian Blair. Brian, stand up. I mentioned he's my successor because I don't like to say he's my replacement. Uh, so, but we're looking forward to having Brian on board. Uh, and so today I'm going to kind of kind of go through kind of a fast-paced uh, uh, program here. Uh, there'll be answers, uh, questions, and answers afterwards. I hope, and I know there's probably a couple I can uh, guess what they're going to be. But what I want to do here is, is kind of start a community conversation about the future of the York Fair and York Expo Center. Uh, some of the comments I say here are mine personally. I got a lot of my board members here and staff here. Uh, I'm very appreciative of them. But uh, being close to retirement, sometimes you can kind of say things more like the way it is. Uh, so, uh, but, but in all sincerity, we do have a great board. It's been a great uh, uh, 10 years that I've been here. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, helping in the future as needed. So my uh, goal today is basically twofold to start a community conversation about how the York Fair and York Expo Center should be organized. And they'll become clearer as I go through the presentation here. Then also number two is to provide my insights, my insights on the future of the uh, York Expo Center. Uh, this will actually be my 40th major fair I've been involved in. Uh, fairs and expositions have been a big part of my life. So I hope to share some of that background with you as we look at how, the, how I think the fair should be organized into the future. 
one of the first things uh, I, I did when I got here, I was interviewed, of course, by the newspapers, and one of the quotes uh, I told a reporter is, change is inevitable and is a tremendous catalyst to move organizations forward. I mean, how true is that? Uh, and I got after my name there, change agent, uh, because in a lot of ways, I was a change agent when I came here. The first ever GM CEO of the York uh, Fair, before the fair was not a volunteer board. Uh, now it is more of a corporate organized. Uh, we have term limits now. Uh, we actually changed our bylaws. Our bylaws, the basic set of bylaws, went back to 1853. Uh, and recently we changed the bylaws. We've got a more of a corporate thing thanks to a very progressive board uh, and some new ideas. Uh, like I said, we have term limits. Uh, we've really made a lot of uh, changes, and, uh, and you're going to see some of them in the presentation here today. So, now, here are a few changes through the years. Now, when you mention change, especially in this county, people go, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. And so I've heard so many times people say, no, no, no. And one of the things I tell the staff is, find a way to say yes. Uh, that's very important. But here's just a couple of things uh, I want to kind of highlight here. Uh, for example, uh, in 1928, uh, the fair went to a nighttime ferry. Can you imagine the people? They say, oh my God, you can't do it. It's going to be the ruination of the fair. Well, it's not the ruination of the fair. Uh, the fair changed from October. You mean they changed the fair date from October to September? And I'm dying to go back through when I get some time possibly in my retirement to research that. I bet you there's editorials, there's letters to the editors, there's, oh, you can't do it. It's going to be the demise of the fair. Well, the fair is still here. Uh, so we went uh, nine to ten days, two weekends. They hired, uh, hired me when I came in 2008. So there's been a lot of changes, but the real big change, one of the things that's going to be throughout my presentation today is between 2003 and 2018, the fair has transitioned. We're more than a fair now. We are now a year-round convention center. We are the de facto convention center for York County. Uh, 2003, of course, was when the arena was built, and when that was built through the, the last couple years, uh, our income has become 50% fair, 50% year-round. Uh, so that's an improvement over 2003. The fair was generating about 70% of the budget, and uh, year-round was about 30%. So we're tr we have truly transitioned. So we have had changes. Now, one of the uh, quotes I really, I, I, I say this all the time, and I think the staff gets tired of me saying it, but back in 1903, uh, well, we did a history a number of years ago. There was, there was a history of the, the York Fair made. And in this article, it said, by the early 1900s, Farmers were voicing concerns that the fair was moving away from its roots. Can you imagine that? There were 150 special permits on the midway for non-agricultural vendors. That was your food, your commercial exhibitors, all the things that make the, great, the fair great today. Some animals exhibitors claim it is unjust to rob them of the fair's true merits and in a few years is calculated to drive agriculturists away. Basically saying it was going to be the demise of the fair. Well, I'm here to tell you, 115 years later, the fair is, is, is strong and going, is alive and well. Uh, for example, we've got a new Ag Education Center uh, that was developed two years ago. we got a birthing area. Uh, last year we had 24 births in that uh, area. We had antique tractors at the fair. Uh, the, uh, uh, this year we got almost 100 more livestock entered uh, to the fair. Uh, the last year's junior livestock sale with the kids coming forage enough that they come and sell their animals. It was a record year. Over $230,000 was spent. So I'm here to say the fair is alive and well. So if you really think about it, think about change, if it wasn't for change, we'd still be back in the Stone Age. So I think change is good and hopefully you're going to see some more in the future. Now, look at the future. It is important to look at the past, of course. Uh, here you'll see uh, the, the York Fairgrounds, and one of the things I'd like to show about this picture here, this is the current fairground of 1887. Uh, the first fair was held in 1888. This is the Carlisle property. But if you notice the location of it, the York Fair and Expo Center anchors that area. How goes the fairgrounds goes that whole area? And that's something that we need to keep in mind when we look at the future development of the fairgrounds. Uh, so here's an overview. Every year I like to take aerial photos of the fair uh, and, and for a variety of reasons, just to kind of you know, see how things are going. Uh, 
uh, you can historical documents and things like that. But importantly, it's for the vendors. You'd be surprised how many vendors they said no I was on this corner last year. No, I was on that corner. No. We can actually go, we can blow this up, we can find out to the foot exactly where a vendor was. So there's no no problems. Uh, you know, and they're good people. They're good people. So this is the fairgrounds here, but basically it's 89 and uh, 86 and a half acres. Uh, uh, here's Carlisle Avenue, this is north up that way. Uh, we're basically in three jurisdictions. Um, we got just a small little area up here in the corner, less than an acre, uh, in the city of York. We got a little bit of area down here, about 10 to 12 acres in uh, uh, West York Borough, but the vast majority of the fairgrounds is in West Manchester Township. Uh, we got parking for over 5,000 people during a year-round basis. Uh, as Ann said, $200 million of economic impact a year from the 150 events we have. Those are 150 paid events that we have on an annual basis, plus we have a lot of free meetings. We have rotary meetings there. The CBB meets there occasionally and so forth. Um, but we, with all those events, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's quite a complex, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, old buildings of course, uh, we got some newer buildings, um, but uh, uh, like I said, 5,000 cars, 150 events a year, uh, economic impact of over $200 million a year. Uh, this slide here, now why do you think I got the arrows there? Can you, everybody see the arrows? Basically, those are the original buildings. When the, uh, the property was built in 87. Uh, in 88, uh, 89, those buildings were built. Everything was facing the track. And I think that's important to look at because that's the first fairground. You had the harness racing. You had a lot of activities, a lot of infield events there. So everything kind of faced this way. Well, it's kind of interesting because those are the oldest buildings. Some of those buildings are over, well over 100 years old. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of renovation. We've kept good roofs on them, but there hasn't been a lot of renovation of them. Those buildings uh, are the least uh, rentable buildings that we have. Um, but in 1926, that's when the, the grandstand was built. And then in 1955, Moore Hall was built. So back basically before 1955, when the fair was over, that was it. They, they locked up the gates. And they just uh, they stored hay and grain and stuff in the buildings. Uh, they they let the grass grow up and they cut it down and, and so forth. But basically, in 1955, Memorial Hall. So it was slowly starting to be more than a fair. In 1996, <coughs> uh, the uh, addition was put on Memorial Hall. And then, of course, in 2003, when the arena when the arena was built, that's when really we started transitioning into a year-round uh, uh, convention-type facility. Okay, now, um, <coughs> last year we had a, a, a strategic business plan done with the fairgrounds. And what's important about this is that uh, they, ca they wanted to look at us, you know, for the next five or ten years, how can we be competitive, especially in the year-round convention and business. Uh, so they made some recommendations. Now this is just for the next five or ten years to be competitive with other facilities that we compete against. We need to expand the, uh, the arena expansion. Uh, Ten million dollars, Memorial Hall addition, four point three million. Uh, the banquet center, uh, it used to be called the Altman House, the White Rose Room. Now we call it the Veranda Room. Uh, if you renovate it, possibly six hundred fifty thousand dollars. If you replace the whole thing, you're looking at four point seven million dollars. Uh, so all that totaled up is about nineteen million seven hundred thousand dollars. And this is just a quick overview of it. Basically, uh, the study said that we need to expand uh, the arena by 43,000 square feet, uh, add another 15,000 on Memorial Hall. Uh, possibly, uh, in my opinion, I think we need to tear down uh, these buildings, but uh, this, uh, where the veranda room is now, basically just tear that down and, and do something else there. Uh, but basically, you're looking at just for those three, just those three buildings, we're looking at 15.6 million to 19.7 million dollars. And that's basically to stay competitive. So that's something that we need to, when we start having this community conversation, take a look at, you know, how we want to fund that, how we want to be able to finance that type of operation. So, having said all that, though, this is my vision. This is Froelich's vision. Uh, and so, uh, and these are some things that we've kicked around with some of our consultants. Uh, we've had some initial conversations with the board, but this is entirely my perception. Uh, and, and this is what I want to share with you here now. Basically, 
uh, Vision One. Uh, basically, uh, we all uh, we hear talk about the old mill on the, the, the east side of us. I really think, you know, some some people have said, oh, that's where you need to put a hotel and this that. No, we don't need no hotel there. I think you really need some kind of a condo or apartment complex. And I tell you, if you, if you really uh, make some improvements to the fairgrounds, I think people would love to be able to look out there their windows or whatever, see the fair, see some of the activities and whatever. Uh, where the uh, current administration building is, the current administration building is the oldest building on the grounds. Uh, I look at that being turning it into a, a museum. I think you've got a really, really nice museum. There's a number of fairs around the country that have taken old buildings and turned them into museums. Uh, I would, I would, as this me, Todd, tear down all those buildings, uh, put a new 75,000 square foot expo hall on this area here. Uh, you'll notice uh, a sky ride. Uh, a number of years ago we put in a, uh, we, we redid the, the ride midway. Uh, we put some new wider boulevards in or whatever and a lot of that had to do with the possibility of putting a sky ride in. Uh, we do something with that. With the, with the, we, we do away with the track. Do away with the racetrack and that was one of the recommendations uh, from our consultant. Uh, but basically you have a, a really fix this up as, a, as an amphitheater that could be used you know, seven or eight months out of the year. Uh, you'll notice I put a couple of things here, business enterprise. Uh, I think we need to also look at private business coming in and doing things, uh, business that would be related to what we do at the fairgrounds. Uh, so that's uh, those areas. Uh, I do have a hotel on this site. Uh, a hotel to be successful in the convention business or the trade show business has to be close to one of your major buildings. Even if it's 100 yards away or 200 yards away, it just makes a world of difference. It almost had to be adjacent to the building with walkways and stuff. Uh, then I'm looking at, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to move the administrative offices. It's, it's very logical to have those offices close to Highland Avenue. Uh, it just makes sense. Uh, and then also this office complex, uh, I don't know, Laura, you'll love this, uh, you know, the CBB offices could be there. We could have county offices could be located there. So there's a lot of uh, synergy that could be developed uh, at the fairgrounds, not only with tourism, uh, but it could have some governmental type offices and things like that uh, to make it work. Of course, all the gates, uh, some of the gates would have to be changed, but uh, we need to get electronic signage and things like that on the gates as well. Uh, so that's just kind of a, an overview, but uh, what I really think we need to do is, is my, my vision two, and it's the same thing as this, this slide here, but put a 15 to 20,000 seat arena, uh, something that could really anchor that whole area, and anchor the, the fairgrounds. Uh, it would be a really a very nice uh, uh, thing to do. Uh, of course, you know, you'll see that we got the fire and first aid center and some of those things there, but I, th I think it's really a very workable plan. Now this is just a conceptual plan. Now if you got to bring a master plan in, uh, then you know, of course you know you move things around, but conceptually those are the type of things that the area I think uh, the fairgrounds uh, needs to be moving into. Uh, now the question becomes, you know, how do we get there? How do we get there? And um, our long-range strategic business plan, one of the uh, recommendations they made and we did a lot of discussion about it uh, and it talks about doing a this is real small here a 10-year master plan it talks about you know come up with a maintenance program and things like that uh, but the main thing uh, I think we really have to start this conversation about is evaluating the potential for spinning off the Expo Center and its operations to a third party be it a governmental entity uh, a business uh, it could be private business uh, and, and, and their responsibility would, would be to own, manage, and operate, and reinvest in the, uh, the, uh, the, the facility. Uh, and so my thoughts on that would be, now, some people say, well, why don't you just go ahead and do a master plan? You know, everyone loves a master plan. You think the big master plan, put a big map on a wall, and you have this building's going to be X amount of money, this building's going to be that amount of money, and it just sits there. Why? Because you have to have a way to get there. You have to have a, the financial capability. You have to have the organization the ability to get there. If you don't have the way to get there, then why do a master plan? So what this really is in, in, important is this number three here. So we got thinking about how do we get there? Do we really want to do a master plan if we're not organized properly? So I think we need to really take a look at how the fair is organized versus the expo center 
Does it need to be separate? Does it need to be one entity? Or do we need to create a, an additional um, authority of some kind to handle it? So I believe we're at a crossroad, not only for the fairgrounds, uh, but also for our community. When you're looking at $200 million of economic impact, you know, we are one of the leading economic drivers uh, in the county. It's very important to all of us. And you got to remember that the fairgrounds, back in 2003 when the arena was built, they took on the, the, the responsibility of providing the funding, the maintenance, everything for the county's uh, convention center. If it wasn't for that, and, and, and if the commissioners decided to have a county convention center, it come from somewhere, they'd tax or whatever. So we're actually saving all of you tax dollars by actually doing it. But having said that, that's a big responsibility. Uh, and I'm going to address that in a moment. So this is my thought. I really believe that we need to have a York County Exposition Authority. It's an overarching umbrella type of authority. And that authority would be responsible for the operations of the York Expo Center. Then the fair itself would be spun off. So the fair, which when you look way back, was only set up to run a two or three day, day, day event. The fair board was never organized to run a year-round convention center. Uh, so basically, this authority would be you know, taken over. It could be quasi-public. It could be quasi-private. Uh, it could be a county entity or whatever. But underneath, so they'd be responsible for running the day-to-day -day activities of the York Expo Center, year-round operations. Uh, then the fair board would come in two or three weeks out of the year, have a, have a lease, and they would actually lease the facility. And people say, well, is that, is that something that has been done other places? Yes. If you look at the State Fair of Texas, arguably the, the largest fair in the country, they actually lease the, the fairgrounds. The city of Dallas owns the fairgrounds. They own the whole thing, and the fair comes in, holds their fair for about 25, 30 <coughs> days, and then they they remove themselves from it. So it's not a, a crazy idea. It's a very efficient operation and a number of fairs, uh, fairgrounds around the country are organized as part of an umbrella organization. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to kind of make some comments before some questions and answers, but um, the York Fair and York Expo Center is a success story, and I'm going to tell you why. The York County Agriculture Society is the governing body of the York Fair and York Expo Center. And we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization that has taken on the responsibility of maintaining and operating the York Expo Center. That has become York County's Convention and Exposition Center. The York Fair does well, so I want everybody to understand the York Fair does well. The York Fair makes money, it does well. However, the real challenge is maintaining and operating a year-round convention center. And where are you going to come up with, like I said earlier, the $20 million just to do a few things? We're talking about 60, 70, 80, 100 million dollars to really get on a competitive basis with these other, other facilities. In spite of all that, we pay our own debt service. We pay our debt service. Now, if we was a farm show, the state's paying for their debt service. They have a Lancaster County Convention Center. You know, that's almost totally funded by the hotel tax. Uh, we pay real estate taxes. People say, well, why do you pay real estate taxes? Just because you're a nonprofit don't mean you don't pay real estate taxes. Uh, we fought that battle. Uh, we, we, actually, we also pay a, a local government impact fee to the three jurisdictions around us, uh, so we do that. In spite of all that, uh, this is almost miraculous, we are at a break-even point, and that is unheard of for a nonprofit organization to run a fair and also run a a county convention authority, it's un unbelievable that we're actually breaking even. As a convention center, we're, we're competing on an unlevel playing field. Most of our year-round competitors, such as the Farm Show, the Lancaster Convention Center, and numerous other facilities that we compete on, are subsidized at various levels with tax, tax dollars, heavily subsidized. To remain competitive, there is no doubt we need to modernize and reinvest in our facilities and evaluate the potential for spinning off the York Expo Center and its operation to a third party, government authority, commission, or private business entity that would own, manage, operate, and have the ability to reinvest in the York Expo Center. We will begin this evaluation process after this year's fair in, in earnest. Uh, 
And the York Fair I mentioned, uh, which by the way starts in nine days, so I'll see you all at the fair. So having said all that, I just want to, I guess, open that up for any uh, questions and I'll try to answer. Yes? Any questions? Comments? Yes? Um, how did you come to your notion that your teams are 15 to 20,000? Uh, there's, there's, there's actually been some say, and I thought somebody would ask that question. Uh, back here, the, now this is a little blurry, but back in 2000, early 2000, uh, when they was looking at uh, the arena versus whatever, at that time they was looking at the eight to 10,000 seat arena as a possibility on the site, and they, and they kind of backed away from that. They, they figured that just going with the arena right now would be, but they said this, remember, in the future, there's, there's a lot of potential for our arena uh, in, in, in this market area. Yes. Yes. Mike, what's the trend line for fair participation? Is it increasing levels? That's a good question too, because every year the the media and stuff goes, oh my God, the fair, you know, it, 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 uh, you know it's, it's uh, declining and this and that. Well, I'm here to tell you, when I first started, I can't speak of of how they did attendance before my time. But since my time, my first fair, we had about 500,000. Last year, we had 580-some thousand. And so that's well over that's about 15 or so percent. But, but numbers are numbers. But when you look at the total, the ride gross has been increasing. Uh, the, the, uh, we've run a percentage with our food vendors. That has increased. Uh, the, uh, the number of entries this year in livestock is up over last year. So there's a lot of indication that's going to go. You know, keep keep doing well. But having said that, it kind of goes into the question of, of why are we looking at changing the, the fair dates? Basically, we have become a weekend and an evening fair. I think that's obvious. All the major, or a lot of the major fairs in this country, uh, they have changed the fair as schools have, have started earlier and earlier. They've changed their fair dates. Well, the York Fair has stayed, you know, at that time period. So. We kind of miss out on the opportunities that vacation time has, uh, but there's a lot of positive reasons why a lot of the major fairs have kept changing. Delaware State Fair is held in the middle of July. Uh, the Iowa State Fair is held at the end of uh, July. Ohio State Fair, I'm very familiar with. Uh, they moved their dates when I was a little kid. They, it was in Labor Day they ended. Now it's, they moved into the last week of, of July uh, when they start the fair. Uh, so there's a lot to, um, to be said about really taking a look at that. So I really believe, I mean, the fair is going to go on and it'll go up and down. It's very heavy, heavily dependent on the weather. And I know my first year it rained on the two Saturdays. My second year it rained the first Saturday. So I'm thinking, why did I even come here? Because Saturday, I mean, Saturdays are very important. I mean, you know, those are, and then Eric knows that. I mean, with baseball, I mean, those are the big days. But, but, but because of school and you're not allowed to, or not able to have really a day fair, then you're kind of hampered, so you're turning to an evening and a weekend fair, and the more you limit the availability, then weather really can impact it. Uh, but having said that, I really believe, now this is my opinion, I really believe the next major impact is going to be by changing the fair dates. Now once you do that, also what happens is, July is the driest month, except for this year, uh, but, uh, but July is historically the driest month. Uh, we turn away business constantly because of the fair. September is a great month for trade shows. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it's just a great month. So right now we're looking at a couple of events, uh, and Cody, my sales manager is here, we're looking at a couple of events, $200,000, $300,000. We're turning away in September because of the fair. So if you move the fair to July, now all of a sudden, July is our lowest month anyways, it's our driest month, it really starts making sense to take a real serious look at changing the fair dates. So I think that's the only way you're going to get a big, big jump in attendance. Anything else? Yes? <clears throat> so you're talking about investing 15 to 20 million dollars even at the starting proposition. What level of utilization do you need to have to make that kind of investment make sense? And do you see that kind of utilization of banquets and other events really being achievable and sustainable in this region uh, without putting the enterprise in need of subsidies? Yes, uh, well, and, and that, that's where it becomes a community conversation about what you want to be, so to speak. 
uh, if uh, when you look at the economic impact of 200 million dollars a year, you know, economic impact floats in all, a uh, rising tide floats all. I mean, you're not only helping the hotels, you're helping the businesses and things like that. So it really kind of comes down to what do you want to do as a community? Do you want to have a convention center? If you want to have a convention center, then you have to have the resources to invest in it, uh, and so you can get that economic impact back from it. The fair itself is it's fine. The fair itself generates money, makes money, but it's a year-round impact. Now, uh, it's a, uh, when you look at these other communities, almost every major metro area has some kind of a convention center, trade show center, and there's a reason for that, because it's good for business. Uh, and so I really think that uh, if you look at it, there's probably not a convention center in this country that makes money. Uh, they're all subsidized by you know, some, some way. So if you wanted as a private business, if you wanted to go in and, and, and have a, a, a private convention center, it, it ain't going to work. You need subsidies, you need, you need those type of things. And, and that's just a decision that the community has to make. Uh, and so that's why I think the, the, the fair board as we know it today it should be commended because they've taken on a big responsibility. They're really doing a lot for the community, but at some point you got to say, hey, you know, we need money, how do you get that? So by going into some kind of authority thing, uh, you got bonding authority, you could, you know, uh, the bonds could go out a lot further. You got the hotel motel tax. Right now we get 14% of that. Uh, Lancaster Convention Center, I, I believe, gets almost 100% of it. Uh, the State Farm Show, as an operating standpoint, does not meet nowhere near their operating income, but yet the state, you know, puts in millions of dollars for renovations and things like that. So it really becomes a community issue. You know, what do we want to be when we grow up, so to speak? So. Uh, but you still haven't answered utilization. How much would it have to be used to drive enough cash to keep it from becoming a huge burden on the community? Ooh, well, that, that's a good question. Uh, you're probably looking at, uh, I mean, you got to get into day uses. Most convention centers just basically are weekend oriented for the most part. Uh, the key to, is really, you know, driving the, uh, the weekday activities. Uh, but right now, for example, we're making it. I mean, we're breaking even. That if we just had help on the debt service, that we could make a go of it. So uh, it's, uh, and that, that's, a, that's a, I, I think, a, a question that all, Communities address what do you want? What do you want? You know, where do you want the money to come from? How do you want to be organized? 